Good morning, everybody. Thank you all uh, who are in attendance today. If you did not have an opportunity to sign in, please do so, because right after this event, I will be sending out a survey to all of you. And the survey has been a benefit to us and to you as well, because as we continue to collect information from the survey, we're making continuing to make changes in those events as we move forward. Um, for people that don't know me, my name is um, Luz Marino, and I am the diversity and outreach um, specialist for this region. I am pleased to welcome uh, who have joined us today to celebrate this very special contribution, contribution of Hispanics to our nation. The theme of this year, um, National Hispanic Heritage Month, is Hispanic Americans. Embracing, enhancing, enrich, enriching, and enabling America. This event was organized and sponsored by the Snake River Area Office. I want to say special thanks to Erika uh, Lopez and the Snake River Area Office for sponsoring and hosting this event. Also to the illustrators for putting uh, together that beautiful flyer that you see from our special emphasis every month, and to our public affairs office for recording this event. This, the presentation portion of this event will last about approximately 35 to 40 minutes, and we will have approximately about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Oftentimes I get asked, you know, why is it that we have these special observances? Why do we do them? You know, these events and activities are designed to enhance cost cultural and cross-gender awareness. It also promotes harmony, pride, and teamwork. It, it's conducted to recognize the continuous achievements of all Americans to American culture. And I won't go into exp, you know, uh, deep depth and explanation because Ismael here, he has uh, quite a bit of information to share and I don't want to take his time from this event. But if you have any questions regarding the special emphasis program, why we do them, or if you would like to give a presentation even for our, our um, diversity lunch and learn sessions, please hit me up. I just um, volunteered Dave and Dave is going to be giving a presentation uh, about Ireland and not right now, but uh, sometime in January or February. So keep an eye out for those. Also, um, I'm continuing to work with Boise State University. We are uh, creating a program called Let's Talk Diversity. I'm going to be bringing in um, actually students to come in and be able to talk about diversity and roll up their sleeves and work and talk about diversity. What is diversity? What is diversity here in Boise? What is considered diversity? How is it different from our building? How is it different from our communities? How is it different from the cities? So anyway, uh, keep an eye out for those also. Those will be coming. With that, I would like to um, bring Erica. I uh, invite Erica to introduce Ismael. Thank you, Luz. So good morning. My name is Erica Lopez. I'm a public involvement specialist with the Snake River Area Office, but I'm currently on detail here at Region in Public Affairs, so come say hi. <laughs> um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to a very extraordinary individual, a very extraordinary young man, Ismael Fernandez. He's a 2015 Parma High School graduate at the age of 19. He is the youngest person to serve on a city council. He serves in an all Latino city council in Wilder, Idaho. And currently he is majoring in history and in Spanish at the College of Idaho. He volunteers. He volunteers his time at the food pantry, at the library. This young man, since high school in 2013, he served as a page in the Idaho House of Representatives. He's also served the Transportation and Defense Committee and the Business Committee. So in addition to being on the City Council, Ismael is also a youth member of the Idaho Juvenile Justice Commission and a member of the Valley Regional Transit Board of Directors and Executive Board. Wow, 19 years old, this kid has done all that. So please help me give a very warm welcome to Ismael Fernandez. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good morning to you all. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Uh, first, I want to thank Erika and the Bureau for inviting me to be here today. I was excited to hear about this event and it's an honor that you, that you invited me to speak. And so as Erika said, uh, my name is Ismael Fernandez. I am a city councilman on the Walder City Council. And there's a couple additions to, to that biography in that on Monday I was elected to be the secretary treasurer of the Valley Regional Transit Board. And I'm also expecting an appointment to the Idaho Council on Suicide Prevention. Um, 
as Erika said, I serve on an all Latino city council. Uh, Wilder is a small town, agricultural, big on hops. It's about 1,500 people. But the unique thing about Wilder is that it is a majority Latino population. Uh, the 2010 census put it at about 75%. I'd put it closer to 80%, maybe higher than that. Um, so it's, it's mainly uh, Mexican descent. And even though I'm a Lat of Latino descent, I live in a town with a majority Latino population, I had a hard time trying to figure out what to talk about today because the Latino population is very diverse. Con you know, the media and the politics portrays, you know, this one unified Latino vote, one unified Latino population, and that's not really the case. Um, there is no one unified Latino experience. Uh, all of us, are, our families come from all over Latin America. My family uh, is from Mexico, but you could go up to another Latino and you'll find Cubans, you'll find Puerto Ricans, Argentinians, people from Chile. And we all experience the United States in different ways. So rather than give you kind of this general, more academic presentation on Latinos in the United States, I decided to give you my own personal story in hopes that maybe it will shed a little light uh, on one Latino perspective. And so to start off, I want to give you my family's history, a little bit of my family's history. So I was raised by my grandparents. Uh, my father, he passed away in 1997 when I was six months old. And I lived with my mom for, for a little bit, but at a young age, uh, my grandparents took me in and, and raised me, and, and they continue to raise me. Um, the, the job never ends, my grandma will tell you that. Um, so my grandmother is a Tejana. Uh, her family is from Far Tejas, which is in the Valle, in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and my grandma will tell you, my family is 100% from Texas. And I point that out because, you know, when my sister and I talk about identity, when we talk about our family, we say, you know, our family's from Mexico. And my grandma will stand up and say, my family's not from Mexico. My family's from Texas. She said, my, I'm from Texas, my mama was from Texas, my daddy was from Texas, everybody was from Texas. And I point that out because it, it's, not, it's not a distaste for for Mexico. It's, it, that's not what drives my grandma to point that out. It's that it, it's a notion that really has its roots in history, particularly the Mexican-American War. Because Texas has always been Texas. It's never been really a part of the U.S. It's never really been part of Mexico. And if we look back at the Mexican-American War, and we look at, at the time, all the, there was no Mexican national identity. There was, there was no this sense of, of national pride. All the states were individual. And, and that you continue to see that now with Mexicans. But it was particularly good or bad, depending on what perspective you're looking at, in Texas. Uh, Mexico didn't really treat Texas very well. Um, they opposed a central Mexican government because they were their sparsely populated they're kind of spread out. They didn't feel like people in the Mexican capital would really understand them. And so um, that it's, my gra it's not uncommon, that idea that you know, we're not Mexican, we're Tejanos. Even though the term Tejano kind of it means Mexicans in Texas. <laughs> but that's not, when you talk to Tejanos, that's not really how they, how they view it. Um, my grandfather was born in Nuevo León, Mexico which is one of the northern states. But he immigrated to the United States to Texas at a very young age. He was two years old. And my grandpa would call himself a Mexican, but he really identifies more with the Tejano experience in the taste in music and the taste in food. It's more Tejano. And that's because he wasn't raised in Mexico. He, he didn't have that experience. And so at, at a young age, uh, my grandparents worked in the fields. Um, my great-grandparents um, on my grandma's side, my grandpa was in road construction. And so he traveled around a lot. He worked for the roads department here in Idaho. And on my grandpa's side, my grandpa Jesus was a contractor. And he would bring people to work. And they would travel in between uh, Texas, Arizona, and Idaho. And eventually, you know, what? 
early, later on in the late 60s when they came to Hi Idaho, they finally settled. Um, both of my grandparents speak English and Spanish. And I point that out because language is a very important part of culture and understanding people. And so my grandparents will speak to each other in Spanish, almost exclusively in Spanish. But when they speak to me, it's pretty much exclusively in English. They will speak Spanish once in a while, but most of the time we'll, we'll speak in English to each other. Now my mother's side of the story is a kind of a different, <laughs> different story. My mom was born in Cuernavaca, Morelos, Mexico. And Cuernavaca is the capital of, of the state of Morelos. But my, her parents, my grandparents, are from Guadalajara, Jalisco, uh, which is, Guadalajara is the capital of Jalisco. And my grandparents immigrated to the U.S. first. Um, and they came for the typical reasons that you see people immigrate. They were looking for work, they were looking for better opportunities. And at the age of 12, they brought my mom and her siblings to the United States, and they worked in the fields as well. And I asked my mom, when I was preparing this presentation, I asked her, what was it like being an immigrant, particularly an undocumented immigrant? Because my mom uh, was undocumented for, for several years. I said, what was it like? And she faced a lot of negative attitudes. We're talking about the 80s. So there's a lot of negative attitudes towards immigrants and, and particularly undocumented immigrants. And she told me a story of one time when she was in middle school and she was sitting in class and it was all quiet. Everybody was doing their work. And all of a sudden there's a student in the class who shout, shouts, immigration, immigration is here. And my mom was telling me that she remembers the fear and the panic that she felt at such a young age, the fear and the panic that she felt. And it wasn't just her, it was other classmates of hers that felt that same way and she burst into tears in class and my mom still cries sometimes when she thinks about that it, it's ingrained in her memory and it was a traumatic experience for her my mom missed a lot of school at a young age as well because um, my grandparents don't speak English my grandpa understands a little bit but they don't speak English and so at, during school uh, my grandparents would go up to the school and, and check my mom out and bring her to pay the bills or to translate for them wherever. And so she missed a lot of school um, because of that language barrier. My mom became a U.S. citizen in 2002, and she's very proud of that. She's very proud of the work that she did to become a U.S. citizen, but she still identifies as a Mexican. Uh, there's a very strong cultural and natural, national link between my mom and Mexico. And it's the same for the rest of my family as well. My mom, she speaks English, but she prefers to speak in Spanish. And that really started at a young age for her. Uh, because when she was young, my mom was afraid to speak English because she was afraid people would make fun of her accent. And my mom does have a, a, a strong accent when she speaks in English. Uh, it's better now. She will speak occasionally to me in, 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 in English, but most of the time she'll speak to me in Spanish and I'll respond in English. Um, and she is fluent. Like I said, it's better. I can remember when I was younger, uh, it could be something simple. We'd be at the drive through and my mom would refuse to order. She would pull up until my window was up to the microphone and she would have me order. And it was the same when we went up to the drive through window. To pick, even just to pick up the food, she would pull up all the way until my window was at, at the drive through window and I would get the food. Um, my mom got remarried in the early 2000s to my stepfather. My stepfather is not Mexican. My stepfather is from El Salvador, which is a um, small country in Central America. And he came in 1997. And he came for similar reasons, a better life, more opportunities. But one of the main factors is that at this time in 1997, that was five years after the Civil War ended in El Salvador. And, after, and even though the war ended, there was still a lot of violence, particularly gang violence that you still see today. And so my stepfather came to the United States to escape that. And he was undocumented. Uh, 
which is understandable because when your life is at is threatened, you don't really want to wait several years to, to come into the country legally. He did, however, become a legal resident of the United States in 2014, and he is working towards his citizenship. And my stepfather, he still talks about El Salvador, but he actually more identifies with the Mexican culture that the, of, of my mom and of, of her family. I have four siblings. I have an older sister who's two years older than me, and we have the same mom and the same dad. And so we have that same family history, so we share a similar identity to each other. Um, I have three half-siblings. Uh, I have a brother who is 17 years old, just turned 17, and he identifies as Mexican. And it's interesting, my brother, he struggled in school because he wasn't raised speaking English. He was raised speaking Spanish, and so he had to take ESL classes. So it's difficult, and, and his friend group is largely of, uh, of Latino descent, kids who have similar stories, who were in his ESL, whose parents came to the United States uh, to work. And I have a sister who's, another sister who's 13 years old, just turned 13, two, two September birthdays, and they're almost back to back. And she is kind of losing her fluency in Spanish. She doesn't really speak, even with my stepdad, she tends to speak English a lot more than Spanish. Um, and she is still trying to figure out her identity. She went through a time where she identified very strongly as Mexican, but now she's trying to connect with her Salvadoran roots and learning more about El Salvador and, and, and the culture there. And then I have my youngest brother who's four years old, and he's not old enough to form an identity yet. And he doesn't speak, but he shows some very strong signs of bilingualism. And the words that he can say, it's a good mixture of English and Spanish, and he'll respond to people when they speak to him in English, and, and he'll respond when they speak to, each other, when they speak to him in, in Spanish as well. And as far as my oldest sister and I, we were raised together by my grandparents. We speak to each other mainly in English, uh, but we do speak in Spanish. It's mostly when we're joking around or when we're arguing or when I'm making fun of her. Um, and then to the rest of my siblings, we speak to each other in English. So as you can see, even though my family kind of comes from the same general area, we're still very diverse. Uh, I have, beyond my nuclear family, I have relatives who have strong cultural connections to Mexico, who identify with those immigrant roots. Those are typically the first generation cousins that I have. It's more predominant on my mother's side. Uh, but then I have relatives who don't speak Spanish at all, who don't understand it, uh, who don't really have that cultural connection to Mexico, or, or who, who really don't even identify as Latinos. They're the ones, uh, and I'm going to use a word that I really hate, they're the ones who take more of an assimilated viewpoint of, of their place here in the United States. And those are typically the second generation relatives that I have or older generations here. And so now to give you a little overview of my family, I want to talk to you a little bit about myself and my own identity and how that's been formed. And to do that, I have to talk about my experiences in school. And it starts really at a young age when I was in elementary school. So as you can imagine, I really didn't see myself as different from anybody else at that age, which I think is pretty common for kids that age who don't really have a lot of experience in life and who you know, aren't exposed to, to some of the harsh realities. And that changed pretty quickly. Uh, I remember a time when I was in third grade and I was speaking to a student who had recently immigrated to the United States. And I was speaking with him in Spanish. And all of a sudden, I have a staff member come up to me and they tell me to s stop and to not speak Spanish. And they gave me two reasons. The first one was, quote, unquote, the non-Spanish speaking students think you're talking about them. And the second reason was, here you need to speak English. So I have, I have two issues with that. So the first is, I don't really understand how you can come to the conclusion that somebody's talking about you if you don't speak the language that they're speaking. I just, I, I don't understand how, how they, ended up. And it wasn't like I was pointing at anybody. I mean, I was laughing because I like to joke around, but I wasn't like pointing at anybody. So how they came to that conclusion that I was somehow saying something bad about them, I don't understand. And the second, 
point is that linguistic identity and cultural identity go hand in hand. And I want to read you a quote from one of my favorite books. It's by the Chicano and queer theorist Gloria Ansaldúa. And she wrote this book called uh, Borderlands slash La Frontera, the New Mestiza. And she has a chapter in here, chapter five, which is uh, my favorite chapter entitled How to Tame a Wild Tongue. And it deals with linguistic identity. And she has a quote in here by Ray Gwynn Smith that goes, who is to say that robbing a people of its language is less violent than war? And so what we need to understand about linguistic and cultural identity, when you take one away, you're doing damage to a person. And by telling someone not to speak the language they choose to speak in or that they're comfortable in, you're really taking, apart, taking away a part of who they are. And it's really degrading, and it's really dehumanizing. And so as I said, this was the, really the first time that I remember feeling different. And I didn't like it. And I didn't like being singled out for one characteristic that I possessed. You know, for me, speaking Spanish wasn't a big deal. Uh, it's the language I use with my mom and with my grandparents. Uh, I, you know, I was raised bilingually. I didn't put more value to one language. I didn't find one more appropriate or more acceptable than the other. And so this experience that I had it really uh, did have consequences in the future, particularly in middle school. Um, I'd say I, I am the victim, I am a victim of bullying. I was bullied for six years, from second grade until the first semester of my eighth grade year. I endured pretty much all types of bullying, uh, social, verbal, cyber, etc. And I was targeted for a number of reasons, but my identity was a major issue. See, at this time, I, I had friends, but I didn't really have a group that I identified with. Because for my Mexican peers, I was too white. And then for my, my white peers, I was too Mexican. And so I don't know how they determined this. I didn't know there was a scale of Mexicanness. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, wasn't, I didn't get the memo. Um, and so I didn't really know where I belonged. I really was made to feel ashamed of myself. And so, as a result of that, I went through an identity crisis, which isn't uncommon for minority youth, particularly those who have families who immigrated here, but were born here and are you know, still trying to figure out where they belong. So I began to lose my fluency in Spanish in early middle school, um, mainly because I wasn't allowed to speak it in school. Um, and I really began to lose an interest. I didn't want to identify as a Mexican because I saw those negative attitudes. And I, you know, I grew up in, in a very conservative um, and, and very white uh, school district. So for the second semester of my eighth grade year, I transferred to the Parma School District. And the bullying stopped, but I still didn't know where I fit in. During my freshman year of high school, I attended, I was invited to attend a meeting of FHLA, which is the Future Hispanic Leaders of America Club. It's an organization predominantly here in the Treasure Valley, but they're really trying to expand um, throughout the state. And it is targeted toward, anybody can join, but it's mainly targeted towards Latinos. And they put on state conferences pretty much on a monthly basis so that students, excuse me, can come and hear different presenters and, and things like that. And so I attended this first meeting, and at the meeting, I met people who had similar family stories to me. You know, people who had par immigrant parents, who worked in the fields. And then I attended a state conference shortly after, and I heard from different successful Latinos in the state of Idaho who took great pride in their identities and their culture and their work, and who wanted to share that with students and wanted to help us grow in our own cultures and identities. And as a result of that, I began to feel a greater sense of cultural pride. But I still didn't have an identity. I, I still didn't have a word that I used to describe how I felt about my, own, about my own being. And that plays into the work I do now, which is on the city council. And before I go into a little bit of that, 
I, I, I didn't tell you about how I got on city council because the number one question that I get, well, the second number one question I get is, you're 19, what, how did this happen? Why, why, how did you get involved? Why did you get involved? And so it really started at a young age with a very good and very close friend of mine who is the uh, recently former Mayor John Bechtel. And he was Mayor of Wilder for forever. I mean, he has had a, he had a 30 plus career, year career in, in Wilder City politics. And I met him when I first began to work at the food pantry there in Wilder. And he would always tell me, son, you need to run for mayor one of these days. You're going to replace me. He said, I guarantee you, you're going to be mayor. Uh, I'm, when I retire, you're going you're to run for my seat. And so that was several years past. 2014, I turn 18, which is the uh, minimum age to run for city office. And then 2015 comes, and that is the year for Idaho municipal elections. And in Wilder, we had three positions that were up for re-election. We had the mayor and then two city council seats up. And so in really early 2015, I'm going to say around March, uh, John comes up to me and he says, son, how old are you? I told him, I'm, I'm 18, John. He said, okay. He said, well, you know you have to be 18 to run for office, right? I said, yeah. And then he said, I'm not going to run for re-election. You should run for mayor. And... <laughs> You know, it was, it was kind of a shock, number one, because John was retiring, and I didn't expect John to, to ever retire. But, you know, I, I did feel honored that he had that confidence in me. And I talked to my grandma. My grandma's not happy about <laughs> me going into politics, and she didn't want me to start. And so after I talked to her, I thought, you know, I'm going to be a full-time college student, and it's going to be very difficult, even though while there's a small town, it's going to be a difficult situation, running, <coughs> running a city and then going to college full time. So I told John, thank you, but, but I, have to, I have to decline. And so a couple months pass, July comes along and John comes up to me again and he says, son, he, he's from the south, so he says son a lot. <laughs> he, says, he said, son, Leonard Wilson is not running for re-election. Leonard Wilson was a member of the city council and he had been there on and off for, for quite some time. And so after talking to my grandma again, um, she gave in, and I decided to declare for that seat. And I thought it was going to be easy, because I declared right at the beginning of the filing period. And at that time, there's only two people who declared, myself and then the other incumbent council member, uh, Roger Howell, who had been on the council for 24 consecutive years, and he was running for his 28, 20, for four more years to make 28. And so I thought, this is going to be an easy. They've only got two choices. It don't matter how many votes I get at this point. I'm going to win anyway. It was not as easy <laughs> as I thought it was going to be because at the end of the filing period, five people total had decided to run for city council. And by that time, I decided that I could either get second place or I could get a close third. So I still thought I had a shot of winning, but... I wasn't as confident anymore. I campaigned for four days, August or October 30th, October 31st, November 1st, and November 2nd. And I waited so long because I, before that, I'd been in involved in politics for five years. And so I had connections in big cities and small cities. And all the big city people were telling me, you need to start campaigning now, and it's, it's like August. You need to campaign now, you need to get yard signs, you need to get business cards, you need to have house parties, you need to fundraise. And then I had this, wild, people in Wilder are like, what the heck are they talking about? It's like, this is Wilder. It's 1,500 people, and there's only like 300 registered voters. It's like, oh, you, gotta, you don't even have to do all that. You just go door to door, and, and, th and that's what I did. Uh, my, grandma, my grandparents have been in Wilder for 40 plus years, and so I would go driving with my grandma, uh, and she's on the election board in, in Canyon County. So she would, we'd go buy houses. She'd, oh, those people vote. Those people don't vote. Those people don't vote, but they might vote if you go up to them. So it's a very strategic campaign. <laughs> and on, on Halloween, on October 31st, um, Mayor Bechtel handed out my flyers while he gave out candy. And then I had a supporter of mine come up to me. She's taking her kids trick-or-treating, and she said, Ismael, do you have any campaign flyers? And I said, yeah. And, she said, give me some, and then I will hand them out 
to the houses where I take my kids trick or treating. So she did that, and then I, every year, I, I, I get stuck handing out candy every year. It's not a job that really any of us <laughs> enjoy doing, but somehow, I don't know how, my grandparents persuade me to do it. But this year was very advantageous because I was, I, I was able to um, give the kid an ultimatum. You either take my campaign flyer or I don't give you any candy. <laughs> and so it was very effective. I think I might try that again. And so by election night, you know, it's a Tuesday. I go to class. I can't pay attention in class. All I can think about is this election. And I had a club meeting until 6 o'clock. So I get home. By then, I'm really tired. And I tell my grandma, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen, but I just don't want to get last place. I said, I, I, don't, I, just, I don't know where I'm going to go, but I just don't want to finish last. And so I waited up all night, which is until 9.30, because it doesn't take that long to count the votes in Wilder. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the night, the results come in, and I received 60 votes, 25.42% of the vote. I got first place in that election. And none of us could believe it. I told my grandma, Ismael, are you sure? I said, yes, grandma. The county reported it. But the news hasn't said it yet. My grandma doesn't believe anybody unless Mark <laughs> Johnson is the one who declares. The same thing with my grandpa. My grandpa didn't even believe it until really, I, I don't think he believed it until February after I was sworn in. <laughs> Um, and, and soon after the election, once we got, you know, pa past the, the excitement, we realized, and people in Wilder began to realize that we had elected a fully Latino government in Wilder. And soon after that, the media coverage began. And we had people from uh, the Associated Press contact us, Univision contacted us, and then there's the local press, uh, the Idaho Press Tribune. And there was many positive reactions to that. It was, it was a historic occasion. You know, here we are in the state of Idaho where only 12% of the population is Latino. And we have this city in Canyon County, a small city who elected 100% uh, a Latino city council and, and government. There were many negative reactions to, however, and I do want to, I, wa I want to read some that I got. So the first one, how many of them have assimilated and know our form of government? I hope they're all patriots. I heard Walter has a huge cockroach infestation. Mexican flag will be flying now. That should, I have an issue with that sentence grammatically. <laughs> and, and so what? Race doesn't matter. And then my favorite, I'm glad I moved away from there. Now, most of us are probably thinking, ah, it's just a few people. It isn't. And on September 7th, the Idaho Statesman published an article about uh, how the year was going in Wilder and you know, how we were adjusting to our new offices. And there was one Wilder resident who, who was not shy about expressing how he felt about his city's government. And he said, quote unquote, it's an all Spanish assembly and nothing's going to get done. So I just want to make a clarification. I'm not Spanish. And I say that kind of jokingly, but I also mean it seriously. Um, a lot of Latinos actually aren't of Spanish, direct Spanish descent. We do have Spanish, uh, some of us have Spanish in us but we're not of direct Spanish descent. So it's actually, it's not correct either way to call us Spanish. And the, set, the second thing he said, uh, because we are all of the same identity, quote unquote, um, I don't think they're going to disagree. They're going to agree on everything. And so these comments cut very deep, especially for me because, you know, on my time on the city council, I, I've prided myself in speaking up when, when I feel, ne what, feel it's necessary. And I have at times been a critic of some of the mayor's decisions, and I have b been in, the d in disagreement with my city council members. And you have to remember that I'm fighting two battles at the same time here, because I'm fighting the first, which is the battle about my age. And you know, there's people who feel that I'm not experienced enough to be in politics and government. And, but I can handle those because I know, you know, every year I get older. And as the time passes, the more time I spend on city council, the more I do and the more I age, those criticisms are going to go away. 
but the criticisms about my race, the criticisms about my identity, the idea that I'm incapable of governing, the very idea that I'm incapable of just being an independent human being because of something I don't, because of a characteristic I can't change, those won't go away. No matter what I believe, no matter what language I speak, uh, no matter how I dress, no matter how I act, my identity won't change. And with all of that, people still ask me, what's it like being a Latino elected official in Idaho? And I think about that question. And the first thing I think is, well, it's lonely. You know, I, I'm one of only a handful of Latinos in elected office in the state of Idaho. And there is a lot of pushback uh, uh, against that. But then I think on a broader level, taking away those negative comments, taking away the criticisms, just thinking on a broader level, and I ask myself, am I supposed to feel different? How am I supposed to feel? Am I supposed to, as an elected official, feel different than my non-Latino colleagues? Are my goals and the way I represent my constituents, are those supposed to be different? Which brings me to my conclusion. As I stated earlier, I struggled with identity from a very early age, and I still do. I don't have an, an identity that I um, align with. You know, I can't call myself a Tejano because, you know, my grandmother's from Texas, and I've been to Texas once, and I loved it, and I wish I could go back more, but I, I was never, I wasn't born there. I didn't have that Tejano experience. I can't call myself a Mexican, even though my mom's from Mexico, and I've been to Mexico once, or twice, and I liked it the second time I was there, and I wish I could go back more, <laughs> but I wasn't born in Mexico. I ha haven't lived the Mexican experience. I could call myself a Latino, but I feel that's too broad of a term, and it doesn't do justice to my roots. And I could call myself a Chicano, but there is a very large political aspect to Chicano. And due to some of my political beliefs, I don't feel like I, well, I know that I haven't been accepted by others who identify as Latinos. I could call myself a Mexican-American. There's a lot of terms. But at the end of the day, when I think about it, when I think about my service, you know, it, it doesn't matter what I identify with. At the end of the day, my goals aren't different from yours. Sure, we're different. Our families come from various locations. We have experienced life in different ways. But at the this end of the day, we have the same goals. Number one, to be protective citizens here in this great country of ours, and to be a positive influence on those who look up to us, and to be a positive influence on our communities. And two, to help move this country forward in a positive direction. And that, that's very powerful. And so that's my experience as a Latino in Idaho. It hasn't been easy, and I don't expect it to get easy anytime soon. But I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm proud of the country I live in, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. With that, I thank you all very much, and I will stand for any questions that you have. It's a balance. <laughs> it, it, it is a struggle because, so city council is part-time. Technically, statutorily, it's part-time. Um, but when I got onto city council, I decided that I was going to do a lot more than my predecessors had. Uh, so I was going to do more than just show up to the meetings once a month and, and vote. I decided to get involved in other organizations, so I got involved on the Valley Regional Transit Board and I serve on its executive board. I serve on the Environment Committee and the Legislative Committee of the uh, Association of Idaho Cities. And that's pretty time consuming. Uh, luckily, I have very understanding professors. And so they'll tell you, you know, just get me a list of days you'll be gone and, and we'll excuse you. But it's still difficult because missing one day, especially on classes that you have only on Tuesday and Thursday, I, I have a Jewish history class. And you there's, there's a, the history of the Jews is very, <laughs> very extensive. So you miss one class and you miss a lot. So it's been a struggle. 
Um, but it, it's been manageable so far, so far. Yes? What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> what do I want to be when I grow up? So there's two things that I want to be when I grow up. The first is I want to teach. Uh, what I want to teach, as far as grade level, I don't know yet. Um, my history and my Spanish advisors both want me to go uh, to graduate school and get my PhD. Uh, my history advisor wants me to go and get my PhD in her specialty, which is Latin American history. And then my Spanish professor wants me to go and get a PhD in her specialty, which is Chicano literature. Chicano literature. Um, I've always had a passion with working for, with kids uh, with disabilities. And so I kind of want to go and get my degree, uh, my master's degree in special ed and teach at the secondary level. And then the second part is, of course, I want to go into politics. And I do, <laughs> the look on my grandma's face every time I say that. <laughs> and, and I do plan on, on running for, for the legislature sometime during my service on the city council and, and going uh, higher up eventually. And so those are kind of my two goals, the two things I want to be when I grow up. Yes? So first off, uh, great speech. Thank you. Uh, great message. Uh, I don't think these issues, regardless of whether you're from the inner cities or the rural yeah. parts of Idaho, have gone away oh, no. since we were kids, most mm -hmm. of us. Um, but I was curious if you thought about doing public speaking for kids. You know, that's a great message to put out there, especially on kind of that bullying front. I have, and I actually, when I was in high school, I did speak at the Wilder and Parma Middle Schools about bullying. Um, but I have thought about going on a on a larger scale to an extent because it is a very important message, and that's really what it's about, um, especially now where you do have a lot of kids who are struggling. Like I said, regardless of where they are, uh, it could be kids in Chicago, they could be kids in Wilder, Idaho who are struggling with bullying, who are struggling with identity. And so I have thought about going and, and speaking to youth. And that's something that I hope to do in the future, for sure. Any other questions? Yes. So if he asked you again to run for mayor, is it still going to be a no? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I have thought about running for mayor. Uh, I am up for re-election in 2019. And so that's also the time when the mayor's seat is up. So I thought about either running for mayor or running for, for re-election. So it's a maybe now. Yeah. It's not a no, it's a maybe now. <laughs> Any other questions? What does your grandma think of you now? I, mean, I don't, I haven't asked her, and I'm not sure I want to ask her, so. <laughs> 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 and, uh, well, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> that's what she says in public. We'll see what she says. <laughs> When we get I home. Don't like this political stuff. I know. My grandma's been very resistant. She said, ah, they go digging for everything. I'm like, well, what do we have to hide, Grandma? I'm like, I don't <laughs> <laughs> what kind of food do you like? Where? Uh, I just don't, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's his choice. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the reason why I want to run. I would do want to change that. You know, there's a lot of good people out there who would love to run for office, but they don't just because people are so critical. Like any little thing you do, and it shows up on CNN for like seven weeks. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's crazy. And so that's part of the reason why I run and why I want to run for higher office. I do want to change that climate so that people, so we don't have crazy people running all the time for office. So we have common sense people who really want to do what's best and who don't want to follow what a party says or what one ideology says. Who, people who just want to do what's best for this country. Yes. Just out of curiosity, did you do student government in junior high, high school? Oh, yeah. And how did that, if you did, what are the lessons you learned to prepare you for what you're doing now? Um, it was a little easier being in student government than it is <laughs> <laughs> being in city government. Um, I was school board representative uh, in high school. I had other positions, but that was the one that, where I learned the most. Uh, and that's where I really learned to stand up more. Uh, when I ran for school board rep, I thought I was going to have kind of a, a semi-policy role, you know, where I was going to go and I was going to have a say in the different policies that the school board would make. Um, when I started the job, I found out that I was just a sports reporter. Um, I don't like sports. I don't, I don't do sports. And so I was very disappointed with that. Um, and so that's where I learned that, you know what, if you, if you don't like the way something's going, you know, you don't just run from it. You don't go away. 
you, you stand up and, and, you, and you do have a say. And so I did stand up. It was unusual. It took the school board members by surprise. But um, the young women in, in my school were having a problem with the dress code, um, mainly with the reason that their strict dress code was being enforced. And they came up to me and they said, you know, we, we need a student. We need somebody to go and, and represent us. And I told them, well, I don't know how the school board's going to take it. And they said, well, you know, Ismail, sometimes you can't make everybody happy. And, you, you know, you have, to, you have to go beyond that. Your role is much more complex than you think it is. And so with that, I went to the school board. I said, these are the issues. They didn't do anything, and they didn't listen to me. But it did teach me that lesson, that you really do just need to stand up when you feel like something's going wrong. Uh, Mayor John Bechtel always told me, and he still tells me, do the right thing, not the popular thing. And I learned that in, just in, at a young age, just even in high school, being in, in, in student government. Um, like I said, it was easier. I didn't have people calling me, telling me about the dog parking and their neighbor's yard and to go do something about it. Um, but there's still quite a, still a valuable lesson to being in student government. And it does kind of prepare you for, for future office that you may hold. Any other questions? I have one, Ismael. Yes. How has it changed in your life and your friendships? Because I know um, in our Lat that Latino community, as you get educated and you get up higher and you got to drive a nicer car, you got a nicer house, some of those friendships sometimes will uh, go away yeah. and it will change. How has that changed for you? So there are some friends that I've kind of lost throughout the years. Um, there are some friends who at the beginning thought you know, that I felt that I was better than them. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I still have the best friend that I had in kindergarten. We're still best friends. We're going on 12 years strong now. Um, and I just make it clear to my friends that no matter what I do in life, you know, whether I become a senator or governor or president, I'm still going to remember who they are. Because you have to remember your roots. You have to remember who you grew up with. You have to remember your family. You know, and, and they've done a pretty good job of keeping me humble. And, and the same goes for my family, you know, that no matter how successful I get, I am still the son of a Mexican immigrant. And I'm still the friend to people in Homedale School District and Parma School District. Um, I make an effort to make sure I maintain those friendships. Um, because it doesn't matter how successful you become. If you don't have friends, if you don't have people to share those experiences with, it's not worth it. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, but I think your grandma deserves a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> you know, my grandma will tell you, I didn't do anything, it was all him. But I will tell you, had it not been for this woman, I would not be where I am today. She instilled in me so many positive values and, and beliefs. You know, I was raised by a very strong, independent woman, and I am thankful for it, because that shaped who I am, and it shapes who I continue to grow into. Uh, and so she, she doesn't take as much credit as she should and as she deserves. Yes? So one of the biggest takeaways I think from your message here is you've had some great mentors. Oh, yeah. What would your message be to some of your mentors? It's going to start off negatively, but I promise it gets positive. <laughs> Life ain't easy. There are going to be a lot of bumps and be hardships, but they do end. The bullying ends, all of that ends at some point. We all make mistakes, but that doesn't define who we are. And I, had to, I actually did have to use this message with some kids at an event that I recently uh, organized, um, where they, they did something that they shouldn't have. And, I, and, and they, one of girl in particular, took, took it very hard. And I told her what I'm going to tell you my message is, which is we all make mistakes. We all make bad choices. But that's not who we are. 
That doesn't define us. Our mistakes don't define us. What defines us is what we do after those mistakes. What do we do the minute, the hour, the week after that mistake? Do we wallow in self-pity and, and, and just keep going down the same road? Or do we own what we did? And do, and do we try to do better in the future? That's what defines us. So just because you make a mistake, it doesn't make you a bad person. You just have to continue moving forward and, and owning what you did and not regretting. There's no point in regretting your mistakes because those are in the past and you can't change them. And the more you regret, the, the, the less enjoyable life is. So you have to own the mistakes you made and you have to move forward and you have to try to become that positive influence. So that would be my message. Any other questions? Thank you. Just give another applause to my wife. Thank you. We're on. The message that Ismael brought to us today goes back to the message that I continue to imply or to give every month as we continue to have these SEP events. You know, the most successful government um, agencies place diversity high in our priority list. And I'm very happy to be able to work in an agency or government agency with the BOR and with Lori Lee and my boss, uh, Bert, that um, support this program and other various program managers that uh, visit with me uh, periodically. Uh, very fortunate to have, have this opportunity to be able to have these di different kinds of diversity events. And with this, I would like to say that I know that we have a couple of or several uh, hiring program managers. As we continue to move into 2017, you're going to see the presenters are going to be uh, various, uh, but we're working with, like I said, colleges and universities. We're going to be able to bring in some young individuals that are going to be able to come and give a message on the special emphasis programs. And we'll give you an opportunity as a hiring manager to see what's going to be the cream of the crop for you to be able to hire as you be able to hire from the internship program or from the student educational employment program, uh, the various kinds of um, individuals that will be able to uh, hire as yourself. Also an opportunity to be able to do some cross-cultural um, training and to be able to meet the different kinds of diversified candidates and the diversity and the um, flourishment that we bring into our workplace. So with that, I would like to invite you, um, Henoveva Munoz and myself, we made some homemade salsa today. And uh, we've got some salsa and some chips out in the front. It's homemade. Um, go ahead and uh, taste it, uh, meet someone, get out and meet somebody. Um, if you don't know someone, I challenge you today to reach out to somebody that you have seen but you haven't met personally because this is how, how we grow. This is how we can communicate and we can make this place a better place to work. So with that, I would like to end this event and thank you all for coming today.